Welcome to another Lunch with Philip and Greg. Today's guest is Steve Martin. Steve hardly needs introduction, but he is uh, the principal behind uh, Ripple Training and has been presenting at conferences forever and a day. And uh, I know we know him from when we first moved to LA. He's been one of the, our longest standing friends. So welcome, Steve. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, paying for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are at another conference. Another so there we go. Yet, yet another one. Yes. Creative Summit in 2016. Tell us, um, what is it that you, you do? Just explain in detail. Well, I like to consider myself a storyteller like, like you. I, I, like to, I like cameras. I like making movies. It's kind of my first passion. And I kind of parlayed that passion into a training company. Yes. Um, I, I, I was cutting on, you know, tape and using switchers and all this very expensive infrastructure way back when and and I discovered the Media 100 and that was when I kind of first came across you guys yeah uh, you had a manual on like how to the Media 100 <laughs> yeah <companion. media. laughs> I remember I remember it was a, it was in a binder yeah. with a little eyeball on it or, and then you open it up and there was all of this you had these little you had these little like almost like uh, avatar guys little guys that uh, little cartoon characters yeah, you guys yeah, remember yeah. that yeah yes. we do yeah, yeah it was um, how to the toucan that's right yeah. and no, tip the toucan. Tip the toucan. <laughs> That's right, it wasn't how to. Yes, tip the toucan. I remember tip the toucan. And that, it was very, very clever, and it really helped me learn the Media 100. Oh, terrific. So that was a, that was a lot of fun. That was my first introduction to, to you guys. And, and then I worked for Ron Margolis, which was Intelligent Media, and he was a reseller. And he was selling Media 100s, and that was how I got to know you. And then uh, we got an advanced copy of Final Cut Pro 1, right, with the yeah. Firewire. And that's, that, cha that changed everything after that. So you and I, I remember you and I um, at the NAB that Final Cut was finally released, getting together and comparing notes and, work, and trying to re work out how did you actually nest a sequence? Yep, yep. Because it had, it, had, it had caused me, I hadn't been able to work it out. I'd, I'd had to just render it out and then put it back into my file. And we were talking, walking across the show floor before it opened, talking about what... What was really impressive to me is that you created an interactive CD called the interactive CD-ROM called the uh, DV Companion, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. It was, I even remember your marketing line, it's knowledge at the point of need. That's right. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it was great because you had brought it and you were showing it to me on your uh, little laptop. It was a... Uh, they call it the little toilet laptop. Yeah, the one was that orange one. Or the yeah. yeah, yeah. You open it up, and you all, you, you were so impressed because you had uh, you had you do these little movies inside that that you can interact with, and it's like look what Greg, look what Dr. Greg did. And you know, you realize all the trigonometry behind this. You were all impressed with the trigonometry for some reason. But uh. we were we were we were the only people that you that I think that ever put a movie inside an Apple Guide floating palette. That's and right. Yeah. That's right. And that's what was you. Were, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, it was. So. Um, you weren't always doing the, the training position that you're in now. You, you've obviously had some filmmaking experience, but how did you, how did you get started? Uh, I've always been interested in, in movies and filmmaking and communication. I went to film school in LA, actually okay. went through film school and communication and made some short films and we shot on 16 millimeter and edited, edited them using like upright moviolas and I, I did all that. So I've had the background of storytelling, but with, with actually motion picture um, infrastructure. And then, uh, and what I call uh, Edison technology. Edison technology? <laughs> yeah, Thomas Edison, oh. <laughs> who had pretty much invented the motion picture camera, right? right. Uh, so, and then after I got out of school, I worked in the ad agency for a while, and I did, I worked on big, you know, big switchers and D1 machines, D2 one inch tape, and then, and that was, we did, that's how I cut my teeth. Uh, storytelling, uh, which is cutting commercials in, uh, in that environment. And then I saw, and then when I went to NAB, it was around 96, 97, I saw the, the it wasn't even, it wasn't even the Abbott, it was a, it was a, it was a PC-based nonlinear called the D-Vision. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. You remember the D-Vision? So, <laughs> I know, I'm going way back. So I saw that, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. We can do all the stuff I'm doing on the switcher right now, and tape, and then you got to go back and do a pre-edit, pre-roll, all this stuff. It's like, it didn't have to do any of that anymore. Like, just like you, Philip, I'm like, this is the future. Yeah. I, want, I want in. I want in. Division originally be, eventually became edit at um, Discrete. Yeah, that's right. Well, the, the, the next big step for me um, was that there was this product that came out from a company called Radius that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. It was the Video Vision Studio, mm -hmm. and it was it had a card, a new bus card that went in an AV Mac or a six forty eight, a six quad eight forty or what have you with a new bus Mac, and then that card had a breakout box and it had composite and then S Video in. And I had I bought a four I bought a four gig drive that back then was five thousand dollars for a four gig. It was just a little tiny array. Yeah. And then after that, and then like this is great. And I was cutting on 
on Premiere with Video Vision Studio. That was that was what they bundled. Premiere three, I think, they bundled with it, and that was fantastic. And that was kind of my introduction into training. I was so excited about it that I my whole personality is that I once I'm excited, I I just have to go evangelize. I have to tell everybody about it. So. And then, then, and then Ron hired me, and then he was using Media 100s, and then so I just kind of got into the Media 100 training bandwagon, and then, and then Final Cut came out, and then we met, and then that's it. I moved forward, yeah. And history is, yeah. Yep. Yep. I remember having a conversation with you in the, the car park at, at Intelligent Media as to whether you, whether you should move on to the next step in your career, and being uncertain and not wanting to be disloyal to Ron, and it was, a, it was you would, went briefly to creative, um, Digital, oh, Josh, what was Josh's company? Um, I forgot DV about that. DV Creators. DV Creators. I had forgotten about that. I'd forgotten that after I left from Intelligent Media, well, I mean, Josh hired me. Josh hired me at DV Creators and I worked for him. He had, a, he had a, one of the first Monica training products called the um, Power Start. Yes, he, he right. beat us. He yeah, he had the Power Start in you know, that was really good because Apple really promoted it and it was great. And then he had this, this whole tour where we'd go around teaching people filmmaking, the DV Revolution workshops. Yep. And I did that for a while. I went out and I trained people how to set up lights and that was a good gig. But then I like, I don't like traveling so much. I, I don't like try, getting in a plane every other week. This is not, this is going to get old. And it got old really fast. Right. So, so that I'm gonna, and, then I, and then I contacted Patty Montesian, who was uh, marketing at Apple. And I said, you know, Apple was just tra starting an initiative called Train the Trainer, mm -hmm. where they were going to create an actual certification program for Final Cut Pro, Mo DVD Studio Pro, and what have you. And I said, look, I want in, I want to be part of that. And then they hired me to, to go to New York and, and Los Angeles and Chicago and then train other trainers on how uh, to deliver the stuff and then deliver the content vis-a-vis -vis books and then take a test mm -hmm. and get certified. Yeah, and that was a big deal, because, a big deal. Um, because Avid had something similar. There yes, was a way fact, of- Yes, worked at Avid. That's right, that, she did too. That was, that's okay. why, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Avid had something similar. Mm -hmm. And so then now, here's Apple coming along and having this, this proper certification system so that people who were trained, yes. there was a, a sort of a, a standardization that was going on. There was a standard Maybe curriculum. A, quality of, a standard quality. Yeah, yeah. So it meant that it was kind of the signal that, hey, wow guys, Final Cut has hit the big time. This is being taken seriously. and it, there's a need for this. Well, it's interesting because I... back when Apple was serious about professionals. He's like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so um, well, the market has changed so much since then. Um, yeah. It's grown so much since then. I, I think it has. I think we... I just told... Um, they're doing a documentary on Final Cut 7. And, and yeah. what's fascinating to me is that it's not just about the... It's, we can make a big deal out of the software. I get it. Professionals, well, Final Premiere, Black Magic, pr what what tool? I don't think the average person out there cares about the tool so much. They care about telling their story. I was telling my my last session that marketing now is about storytelling. Marketing is telling the story of who you are, who your company is, and and being on YouTube and Vimeo. That's a, that's brand identity. You're creating unique awareness of who you are as a company, and I think the tool. What makes Final Cut 10 such a great tool is it's it's really a tool that the mass, the mass amount of people who aren't steeped in video terminology can, they can pick up and start using, yeah, yeah. right? It's a there's a certain base level of knowledge you need yeah. before you can start to learn a, right. a Premiere Pro or a Final Cut Seven or, right. or, a, or a media, media composer. Right. I, I I sum up the difference between Final Cut Pro Ten and Premiere Pro in terms of in Final Cut Pro Ten. Well, now in Premiere Pro, if you want to get better quality, better performance, you reduce the quality of the playback. It's you know pop-up menu in the bottom of the thing, and so you say for you know if, you're, if I'm working with Red, I might want to work at one eighth to one quarter resolution, and that's fine. I mean it works, but you need to know that's what you do in Final Cut Pro 10. I want better performance or better quality. That's a simple choice that's straightforward to everybody. That's right. You don't have to have any prior knowledge about the the scaling affecting playback performance and not any of that, it's just the quality, just quality or performance. And I can speak to this a little bit too, sure. because um, you will appreciate this, when we were doing training, the very, very first system that we, we created training for was Media 100. I loved Media 100, I felt like I understood Media 100. There were the two tracks, there was the transition track that was in the middle, mm -hmm. I think there was sort of a graphics track or a titles track that was sort of on top yeah. and so it was all very visual and you switch from a track to b track and back again um, there was only one viewer i got it absolutely 
Then um, the next thing that we started working on was that you were um, collaborating with Michael Fierer on a book on Premiere Pro 5. Premiere Pro with a passion. Yep, <laughs> version 5. And so okay, so we've, with a passion. Yep, so we've got, we've got um, Premiere Pro happening there. I couldn't understand that thing. It confused the heck out of me. I'm not a video guy, right? I, you know, n none of that. So it didn't have the the um, the sense of the ana an the analogy, the concepts of what it was. So it completely confused me. And to be honest, Final Cut, original Final Cut, confused me as well because it came from that same kind of um, metaphor. Yes, it did. Final Cut 10 comes along. Suddenly, I feel like I'm back in my Media 100 days because. I get it. I feel like I, I, I really, really understand Final Cut Back 10. Back to that single viewer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not the single viewer so much. It's, it's everything else. It's sort of, it's, a, it's an easier to grasp metaphor for me. And me not being a video person, but I think, you know, um, non-video people are the future of the, the NLE market. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, with the prolif proliferation, <laughs> GoPro cameras, yeah. GoPro cameras, iPhones, yeah. um, DSLRs, yeah. uh, there's all these different formats, and with the, the final compressor, just bring it all, just bring it all, and just met, it's all about metadata and organizing. It's not even, it's not even what the footage is. It, it's, it doesn't really doesn't care. doesn't care. Everybody has an HD camera, Everybody right does. there, right with them at all times. We have an HD camera or more. I mean, I think I did a quick inventory. We have something like ten or eleven HD cameras in our house, between two GoPros, two DSLRs, um, a couple of, of iPhones, a couple of iPads. You know, it doesn't take long before there's always a camera handy, and that changes everything. You know, um, I've probably told the story before on, on lunch at anyway, but we were working um, on a documentary just before we left Australia, and it was a, a young performer, Tim Draxel, who had uh, he wowed at a masterclass to the extent that they said, "You're not, you're not a student, you're competition." But this masterclass um, with you know established performers leading the masterclass, teaching the students. There is not a single video record. It's 1998, and there is not a single standard definition DV, not a photograph, nothing covering that. Can you imagine now that if you had a masterclass with your kids performing and being critiqued by a, an established artist, do you think that there would be a little bit of footage coverage? You'd be able to shoot a multicam. You could even put like three panels of vertical video next to each other. I would imagine in, in the modern era. So having this abundance of cameras just changed everything so much. And Final Cut 10 is the only NLE that really um, accommodates that that sort of democratization. I'll just clarify a little bit. Yeah. An abundance of high quality cameras. Yes. Because, you know, we had cameras in in cell phones, flip phones for a long time, but you know, they were really crap. Crap. <laughs> they, they were crap. So do you, I, I, I guess you're going to be coming down posit on the positive side of the democratization, that, that it's, a, it's a good thing? I, I think, yes, and it yeah. speaks to like kind of the future of, of, of storytelling and, and its content. Everybody has a story to tell, everybody. And video is the most powerful medium in the world. It moves, it has the ability to move you emotionally, get you to think a certain way. It's, uh, it's being utilized so much more as a tool to engage in, again, storytelling and marketing is that. And even the websites, you know, the templates you can buy for your websites now, they're very much story drawn. They're, they're huge panels for video and, and images. And text is becoming less and less an, a, a factor. I mean, just look at, look at Apple's site. It's all pictures. You know, all these sites, is all about pictures, all about visuals now. Because uh, that's what people, you know, yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I think it's a good thing if, like, my mom, she wants to start a home-based business and yes. she wants to get the message out about her whatever quilting or whatever she's doing. Mm -hmm. She can set up an iPhone and use Final Cut Pro or even iMovie and, and, and bring in that stuff and start telling a story. We'll have to hook your mom up with Philip's mom because she's just started an Etsy so store oh, yeah, for right. selling Christmas puddings. It's, that's what, it's, well, it's funny, Any, anyone could be a content producer, anyone could be a broadcaster now. Yeah. Anybody could be a broadcaster. Yeah, because the whole chain is now in place. We have high quality affordable cameras. Yes. We have affordable, simple to use editing software. You can start in iMovie, graduate up to Final Cut Pro 10 when, when you're ready to. Um, find more complexity in Final Cut Pro 10 when you're ready for that. Or in, uh, and then you can put it up on YouTube and it's really at that point it's about the way you can, you can reach an audience. I mean, that's, it's not put it up on YouTube and they will come. You have to then do, I guess, what is brief, broadly called social media marketing to, to bring an audience to your material. But right. Yes, 
the biggest part is getting people to you know find you, and you still have to drive people to your content. Um, but a lot of a lot there's a lot of in marketing circles they talk about tribes and and becoming kind of a, a an authoritative leader in that tribe of whatever it is you're interesting, whether it's quilting or. Or um, would you say your mom was doing Christmas puddings? Christmas puddings. I mean, I, I guarantee you, there's other Christmas pudding people out there that would watch your videos. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, and and with the network, with social marketing, you can connect all of these similar interests together. Yeah. Find that one core market, one easy, starting with your network and building out from there. The one core market. No project is ever successful that tries to appeal to everybody. Oh no, you got to be very, very specific. Who you got to know who it is that you're. You got to know who your audience is. Yeah. One of the questions I like to ask pretty much everybody is, what what do you think's been the biggest change in in your career? I mean, whether that change is the technology or the way society's changed or the way these have worked together, what do you think's the biggest change that you've experienced during your career? Over the past ten years, the biggest change is the availability of these tools. The like you said, the the high end HD cameras. The editing systems that be able to anybody can now tell a story and, and do it in high quality. Um, if they, I mean, they're still going to learn, learn basics about how to light, you know, how to do it, conduct an how to conduct an interview, where use a professional mic, that sort of thing. But that to me is the biggest change, and here's how I know this because people that I don't normally associate, friends of mine that don't normally associate with video, or they even understand that video is important. You know, you have YouTube. I have one billion users of YouTube. Like something like, yeah, one billion. 40,000 videos are uploaded every minute to YouTube. 40,000, a minute. I don't even know who's gonna curate this stuff, but the, the point is, um, everybody has this basic understanding that, that, that video is now the new grammar. It's a new, it's a new form of, this is how we communicate. Form of neutral literacy. Oh, yeah, it's a new, thank you, it's the new literacy. And even people that n normally don't think about video are now, are now talking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, from the mechanic that's at the garage to a, you know, to the home, you know, to the homemaker, to the, you know, to the business owner, to the restaurant professor, whatever. They're all talking about video because it can it can reach people like no other medium can. So I think that's to me the biggest. Yeah. It reaches people on an emotional level, not yeah. not a. Well, yes, exactly. It's emotional. It's an emotional thing. You love this in the high-end Los Angeles real estate market, yes. where they used to just do the, the photographs or maybe the panoramas sure. or whatever. Sure. Now they hire actors and they write a script so that they've got people interacting in the environment of the house while this little sort of drama is playing out. Really? Yeah. In LA, probably only LA. Only yeah. LA. Wow, it doesn't surprise <laughs> me. Well, I, I guess uh, I can understand that you're you're kind of living vicariously through the scene in this place, or they're creating a they're creating this interesting scene. So it's like, oh, I, I can see myself in exactly. that environment. Yeah. Very fascinating. The big thing now with uh, with the my dad hated it when I called them drones, but quadcopters, because my dad was in the engineer. He goes, no, no, drones are weaponized. And, uh, oh, and wow. quad, yeah, which, to, cool. yeah, I know they. Yeah. Even Randy Ubillis, who was totally going to call them um, unmanned aerial uh, camera yeah. platforms, but he's yes. admitted that the drone is the common word now. It, it is. It, they just call them drones, but I mean, they always meant like, you know, shooting, you know, shooting the missiles from high up so no one could see it coming. But, but other than that, uh, that's being really useful uh, for a, a, a tool for real estate. I have a guy that yeah. works with Nick Prescott. He's got four of these drones and, and he's using the drones to, to shoot the tr property, but he's going further than that. He's using uh, some plugins to track the boundary lines. So, so from, as, as the camera moves around, you can see you know that he puts an outline of the boundary. You can you can see where the boundary of the property is. That that's uh, that's stuff that that again a few years ago yes. no one would even think no one would think to do that. I saw some beautiful footage. Um, a place in La Jolla, La Jolla up on, down in San Diego. Yes, up on a hill. Yeah. Um, so the drone goes along across the sort of pool deck beside the palm tree over the surface of the pool, and then the pool infinity type pool drops off, and then we're in the in the canyon down off the end of the, the property and then sort of spin around and look at the house that way. I mean, it's so beautiful. It's so, it's so much more interesting than just still photography. So much more. It, it, it is. And so it I, I- It's another camera position, camera positions that you could never imagine. 
Yeah. And the thing about drones is that I realised back in 2012 when I first my first exposure on the Solar Odyssey project was was that the software is just going to get so much cleverer, more clever that you know the skills that I was trying desperately to learn then uh, to operate because you know it's really complicated if you're trying to do it manually because the the um, you turn the drone and suddenly all your controls have moved by 90 degrees. So Ford is now actually left and right, whereas you know as soon as they got a parrot AR, no. The, the, cap, the drone knows which way it's facing. So forward is still forward, left is still left, up is still up, and down, right is still right, regardless of which way it's pointing. So I don't have to think about that. So yeah, that's all yeah. software smarts. Um, yeah. My friend has this, his drone, and they just, they, this company, I forget what the name of the company, they just went out of business because they didn't, they were, like the, they were like the Mac of the drone world. Um, I forget what the name of it is, but he just, he could program in trajectories, he would go out, yeah. And I mean, you could literally do repeatable paths every single time. Exact same moves. Motion controlled cameras, but it's, it's aerial. Amazing. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Yeah. It is amazing. Even, even consumer level drones will do yeah. spin around me. Uh -huh. um, it's to do that sort of movement in automatically. So, yeah. I think that's the biggest change to be able to put these tools in the hands of the average business owner or homemaker. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Real estate agent. You and you and I and Greg were one of the very few positive voices about Final Cut Pro 10 when it came out. Um, why why were you positive when everyone else was so negative? Yeah, and also bearing in mind that you've um, already answered this question for Brad, no doubt. <laughs> but, but bearing in mind that you know all three of us were were very strongly invested in the in the legacy Final Cut market. Yes, we were. We were very honest. Yes, <laughs> all of us. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I, I think you said somewhere even in. In his trailer somewhere, uh, that like <laughs> overnight our, our sales went drop. They dropped yeah. to nothing. Yeah. Remember yeah. you said that yeah. in, the, in the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah it was, it's odd because other editors didn't have to it had no immediate direct impact on anybody just using Final Cut Pro Classic as an editing tool. They had months to decide what they would do and going forward in the future. You and us it had an immediate direct for serial impact on our business and therefore on our life. That was not compensated in any way, shape, or form directly. Well, it's funny because they always talk about the, the, well, the cliched example now of the pioneers, the first pioneers getting the arrows in the back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, 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 there's some truth to that. You know, you're out there and you're promoting a product that's completely foreign to the way things were done previously. I mean, it's, um, I remember a, a good friend of mine was telling me how he was going in and he was bringing like an Avid, the Avid's into, he was working for Avid and going into a broadcast facility and they'd hook it up and they, they considered the Avid an immediate threat to their job. In fact, he said that it would, they deliberately went, this, this guy that he was showing to, the lead engineer went for lunch and he said, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, get it out of here. And so when the, guy, when the lead engineer went to lunch, my friend went back there and he, and he checked the connections and it turns out that they, he just turned the BNC connections in the back where the card was just enough to where it is, so he went into it just, yeah, so he snapped it back in, and uh, yeah, and because, it, it, I, the, the reason I like that story is because it illustrates that there's there's some legitimate emotional, emotional fear behind these new tools, like I, I don't understand them, and so, and by the way, it's too simple. It, it, it can't. It can't be professional. It's too simple. And by the way, yeah. and by the way, the underlying, the undercurrent to that comment is this is going to affect my livelihood because if anybody can cut video, then that means that I'm not going to be as well compensated because everybody has the same tools that I have. It largely comes from a position of insecurity because right. you know every carpenter has the same hammer. Well, get a nail gun. Well, that's that, that's true, <laughs> but, but 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 you can see where it is kind of an emotional decision. It's like right. I don't want to learn a new tool. I don't want to take this is fun. It's so foreign. I, I don't want to take the time. Even it may be better, but you're asking me to invest something that I don't really want to invest. Okay, so so when Final Cut 10 was launched, you really well, you and everybody had a decision to make. Yes, we did. It, it was not received very well. That was very very yes. obvious. Yes. So is this something or is this nothing? You know, should I take this seriously? Should I invest the time in learning this and creating materials for it? Which feels like a risk because it wasn't received very well. Here's what I think, and I said this to Brad. I said, the way it was launched by Apple could have been different. And you know, <laughs> they, they could have been, I mean, uh, look, if by now it's hindsight, but they did a hard cut yeah. instead of a dissolve. Yes. <laughs> right? Oh, nice. they, that, so, Lovely. That's fantastic. So, yeah, I'm, so, I'm going to borrow that. Yeah. It, it, it dissolve would have been better. It's like, here, we're not, we're not, we're still doing seven, but this is the direction we're going. And by the way, this isn't the, 
this isn't the first iteration. We have plans for this thing like you wouldn't believe. Just stick with us on this. And they, they shepherd them through the process. But um, you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, so we got this, this product. And then that would have been, all right, I'm going to try this. And look, granted, there's going to be some people who are like, this is too foreign, this is too weird. There's no way. This is, I'm never going to, that's fine. That's, that's legitimate. I, you don't have to like the interface. I was, going back to your question, I was captivated with how fast things happened. You know, how fast you can tag things, how fast you can get them into the timeline. Remember, in, even in Premiere and Final Cut, you had to double click, you had to load it in the viewer, you had to set it in, you had to set it out, you had to put you know, F10 or F9 into the timeline. Then you had to click back into the browser, select the clip. I mean, it's clicky, 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 yeah. clicky, clicky, clicky. I was showing in my class yesterday, I go, let's do a string out of only B-roll. So I had an open timeline, and I took the skimmer, and I skimmed over, and right where the skimmer, I, right where the skimmer was going to be on it, skim, E, that's my end point. Skim, E, skim, E, skim, E, skim, E, skim, E. In literally 10 seconds, I had 10 clips that had the end point that I wanted, put in the time that I had option W to add a gap, create my next set of B-roll, skim, E, skim, E, skim, E. You couldn't do that. You can't do that in any, edit, any other editing system. So, fantastic. I mean, I don't want to be doing all this clicking. So, it's... Yeah, I think um, the thing that really, really impressed Philip when Final Cut 10 was launched was the metadata. He's slightly interested in metadata. So, um, Just slightly, I think. So there was all this metadata that was underneath. French fries. I had enough. Anyways, go ahead. All this, um, all this uh, camera metadata and whatever else that was, that was underneath. But it was also um, the keywording, the keyword ranges. It was, it was really... It was really cool, and it was so much better to do that than to, to make subclips. And so that was really impressive, and I think you were very much focused on what it had, the potential that it showed yes. from that very, very first version, rather than sort of focusing on what it, what, what it was missing. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. that's why we were positive about it. It's, it's really interesting because it represented a completely, and I hate uh, in marketing, uh, the word revolutionary is just so over. Yeah, it's yeah, not even yeah, like right, using right, it yeah. because like oh, really, the most revolutionary light bulb since light, you know, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, you yeah. just, you get numb to that after a while, right? So, uh, but I really, I think it applied to Final Cut. I, I absolutely believe the word revolutionary applied to that product. It was the great, you know, great, you know, tool for the proletariat that wants to tell stories. It's yeah. just... Larry Jordan said jaw-dropping. That was my, jaw my, my, my comment. Well, I mean, that's, that jaw-dropping is, is hyperbole, but in one sense, he's right that it, uh, it, it's, it was so different. You know? was, yeah. so. Like, I think there's a sense that, that we've both had long-term dealings with Apple, and we realized that these guys don't do things capriciously. They, they think them through, and, if, and there was a sense that, well, if Apple has thought this through, and this is the direction that we should go, I'm not prepared to dismiss it, because although Apple don't hit and out of the ballpark every single time, they generally win the game. Oh, I see. So you're both Apple fanboys. That's what you're saying. <laughs> well, oh, I see. I, I, I've always been. I, I'm, yeah. yeah but, I mean, I, look, in one sense, I understand the pushback from, you're an editor, you've got mm -hmm. you know, 10 seats of Final Cut, and you're now asking me to completely rethink our workflow. What are you, what are you doing? Yeah. This, I get it. I, I, I totally get that. Well, this is frustrating. I want. I'm used to this. Yeah. Right? I can. I can understand that. And. Um, but we're now what five years in? Four years in five now? Eight, five. Right. And we're. It's time to look past that and say, okay, well, is this a tool that gets a job? And a, a, a lot of a lot of the forums and Facebook people are still arguing about the merits of each. And go, this is, you guys, this is a silly argument. Yeah. I, I, this is silly. It's like, does it? Do what I needed to do. Can I get paid? Can I deliver on time? If it, if it doesn't meet those things, who cares? Right. Who really cares? I mean, so you like Premiere, Black Magic, great. Use that. Yeah. I like this tool, and I have very compelling reasons why yeah. I like using it. And it's, it's really interesting. You know, we're now day three from the launch of Final Cut Pro right, 10.3. Right. Um, one of, of course, the big signature um, features of uh, the original Final Cut was magnetic timeline. Mm -hmm. 10.3 features what they're audaciously, I guess, calling Magnetic Timeline 2, mm -hmm. Electric Boogaloo. And um, I, think it, I think it deserves that because it really is a different magnetic timeline to what we've had for, for the previous five years. Well, I think the main thing that makes it Timeline 2 is the, is the role-based lanes. Yeah, that, yeah. That's really, to me, 
fantastic. The fact I can spill open and see all of my components right yeah. there, close yeah. them up. That's so Apple-like. It's like, look, if I'm a if I'm somebody coming from iMovie, mm -hmm. I don't need to see any of that, and I don't even care. Yeah. I just I'm going to work at the top, the parent level of the role, and I don't care about sub roles. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to cut my story together. But if I need it at some point because I'm growing in my, my mm -hmm. skill level and, and what I'm doing, then, oh, I expose this stuff, yeah. and now it's there. It's, the, I, it's just, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and not having that in your, in your face all the time. You only need to see it when you want to see it. And it, it goes even further, I hadn't realized, but it was the, the demo yesterday was sort of showing how you, you can really, demo? I think so, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I've seen, British, I've seen so guy? much. Did he have a British accent? I don't hear accent. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> That's quite ironic. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Che Baker's um, oh, yeah, thing Jay, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So when he was cutting his film, and he, he had these weird titles that were blocking things off so that, so that he was disabling some of the magnetic timeline and creating these lanes. It was amazing, and it's like, yes, this is what you can have now. I think, I think that makes so much sense. It was a, it was a, a nasty workaround. Well, it's for, interesting about workarounds because I feel like there's still workflows to be discovered. Like yeah. people haven't figured right. out what I can really do with lanes that I haven't done in any other system before. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. like use lanes this way. Oh, that's a very, that's kind of a compelling way to use lanes. I haven't thought about using them that way. Yeah. That's what I'm discovering. Because they really, I mean, they, they've called them lanes so that they wouldn't call them tracks, but they're really not they're tracks not, because it's still magnetic within the lane. That's and right. and yeah. you know, within a lane, you have multiple um, levels of clips if, if they overlap. You, yeah. a, lane, a lane isn't required. A lane can have multiple clips at the one point in time, whereas yeah. a track cannot. Oh, that's a really good point. That's right, because yeah. if you have a split edit, you're going to have yeah. you're going to have them overlap, and you're going to yeah. see them right that's there. You'll have three or four. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's a really good point. That is that's a fantastic point. I really haven't played with it very much, and so I'm still kind of wrapping my head around the whole concept of lanes. But we have some training that <laughs> <laughs> I might need yeah. it. Well, that that transitions in you you. You run a business in a, a small, well, small business in a in a in a, an interesting market. I mean, it's yeah. it's oh, a yeah. challenging market. Yes, it is. And, <laughs> how is it? You know, how is it to run a business that is, at one sense, dependent entirely on somebody else's business? Apple can capriciously change the look of their interface, and suddenly all of the work that you've done for the last five years is no no longer has any addition, any value going forward. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, so how, how do you, you know, what's it like being a small business person in, in the ecosystem? Well, uh, if I can just speak frank here, it's exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, it, it, it's t I, look, I, I, I'm not complaining at all. I yeah. mean, I'm, that's not what I'm coming from, but that's the nature of the beast. Yeah. If you're in a training company, they rev, companies rev software. Yeah. I mean, I deal with that with Black Magic. They, they're revving their software every six months and they're changing, they're moving stuff. Every six months, I'm having to change and record six hours of training. So there's always... That, Which, by the way, doesn't take six hours. <laughs> it takes a lot more than six hours. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you gotta see when uh, Alexis delivers training, it's usually like 14 hours that gets cut down to six. So <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> we're cutting out all this stuff. But the challenging part is that in training, it's extremely labor intensive. Yes. It's extremely labor intensive and now, the, 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 the factors in the market now have, have, have changed in that we are now competing. I mean, it's really interesting, we're on YouTube, it's a double-edged sword, we're on YouTube and we get customers from YouTube. But the other edge of that sword is we have competition on YouTube from some, some guy in his basement doing Final Cut training because I, I actually feel this way and I just, just put that out there. Right now, a lot of people are buying training, some of the older set, you know, I need training, I want, I want structured training. But like my kids growing up, I, I don't know if they're going to be willing to be, pay for it in the future. I think it's going to be, can I find it on YouTube? Can I Google it? That, that's what I'm going to use. I, I'm not, I don't, don't even think I'm going to buy it. I, I, I feel like there's a day coming where, and maybe not five years, maybe 10 years, where there's like the, the idea of paying somebody $60, $70 for training is like, that's dumb. I can Google it now and find it, find whatever I need when I need it. So. I, made, I made the comment to Greg when F Final Cut first came out, I said, I am so glad we're no longer in the training market because this is going to jarner so much free competition. Not necessarily good quality training, yeah, but no. just the fact that there's training there that's, that's free right. is going to cut that, into... That's the biggest change, Philip, is like, I, I, and once I'm competing with the YouTubers out there that are mm -hmm. they're putting out there, and the, you know, here, here, it's, it's really interesting. Um, this came up in my session. We could talk a little bit about business for a moment. I think this would be interesting for your viewers. Um, there's, uh, I, I read this book called Utility 
from Jay Bauer, and it's one of the best books I've ever read on marketing. And he talks about three types of, of, of marketing approaches in the past, you know, 100 years ago. The first one is a top of mind. That was how we've always done it. Your top of mind, top of mind awareness. You're spending millions of dollars putting ad billboards and commercials and radio ads, and then when you come to buy that car, it's like it's top of mind because you've been inundated with all of this content that they spent millions of dollars to get you to see their product. Right. That's top of mind. The next tier down would be um, frame of mind awareness. That is, you're, it's a, the yellow pages or the Yahoo approach where you work in social media and you get in, people are interested, you have inbound marketing, and then when they're ready to buy, you're right there because you've created a frame of mind for your product. Right. That's the yeah. second level. And it's still less money and less time consuming than top of mind, which costs a lot of money, but, but it's a lot more like I'm targeting my messaging to certain groups or Facebook group or Yahoo group here or whatever. Now the third level, and by the way, I'm not making, uh, this isn't mine, this is from that book, yeah. is called friend of mine marketing. Friend of mine, I like friend that. Of mine. And friend of mine is you get people to bring you into their circle of trust as you provide content and you're actually helpful. You become a really valuable resource to them. They trust, and so when it comes time to buy, they don't have to look for you, you know why? Because they're already there. Yeah. They're already there. They're already, there's all the trust already built. So, so when people ask them, why do you give away this free content? Here's why, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote um, the, the guy, remember that, there's a, there was a, a company called Geek Squad, have you heard it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they go out and they fix people's computer. Well, they put on hundreds of fix-it videos on, online, right? right? Hundreds of them. And they, and they ask the, the, the entrepreneur, why? Why do you do that? Don't you, aren't you in the business of fixing computers? That doesn't make any business sense. And, he, and his answer was basically this. Well, most people think they can do it. But once they hit that headroom where they can't, <laughs> guess where they're going to come? Yeah. To the person that they've watched the videos for the past whatever few months. And yeah. that's, that's kind of where, that's my marketing philosophy now. I totally subscribe to this friend of mine thing where you're now, you're connecting with people and you're building trust and you're, you're legitimately trying to help people yes. as, as opposed to just push information yes. out there. Because yeah. people are now numb to it. I mean, we've got... We've got big corporations, we have governance. Most people feel like they're being lied to half the time by either the government or a company. They're, they're, they don't know who to trust. They just don't. And they're, especially with the younger set, they don't, you know, the fact that your business is established since 1892, they're like, 1892, don't care. That yeah. doesn't mean anything to them. Yeah. That just means you've been telling lies longer. <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry. I'm not uh, no, no, so, po point is, this idea of developing relationships yeah. with people is, 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 to me, that that's the future of. If you want to grow your business, you have to do, you have to establish uh, this this idea that you are you're going to be a resource and help people. So that's that's kind of our under underlying philosophy. Very interesting. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's kind of what we do, but but not just not probably not good enough, not well enough. <laughs> Well, it, it's funny because some people say, why do you put all this free stuff? Well, because it helps people. And what yeah, I'm about yeah. as a person, yeah. this, my, my company flows out of who I am as a person, which is I want to help people. Yeah. Right, of course. You still have a, a decent amount of a career ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you... Th well... I, I, go ahead. I finish your question. Sorry. The question is really, the, um, is what do you think will be the biggest change going forward? Will we see another digital revolution going forward? I, that, I don't know what the next big thing is. I know, the rest, I know we've talked about VR and we've talked about HDR, VR, HDR, you know, it's, it's the 3D, 3D was a flop and we talked yeah, about yeah. why, but I, I, I don't mean, look, the bottom line is you still have to be a storyteller. You still yeah. gotta be able to, you still have to engage your audience. Yes. I think the future is helping people learn how to tell better stories, how to engage people, regardless of what the technology is. If we can help people understand what it, how to use a tool to engage someone, to move them in a direction this way or that. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only really one reason, two reasons to make a, a video. You wanna, well, there's actually probably three. This, I'm, I'm being very, very narrow in my definitions, but like you wanna, especially from a corporate standpoint, either to, you either wanna use a video to make money or save money, and there's, there's specific reasons for why you're gonna make video, but now it's, I'm using video to, um, to create a brand awareness. Who, who am I? This is why I so allow people to, to connect with me. Um, it's interesting because here I had at this conference, I had several people come up. This one lady goes, I, I just, this is weird. I feel like I know you. Or, you know, I've been watching you for uh, two years and, <laughs> yeah, awesome. and, I, and it's like I bought all your training and I just feel, you know, I, and that was to me the, the perfect 
solidification of everything I said to you earlier about friend of mine uh, awareness. It's really, uh, I think that's, that's going to be the future um, of the industry. Not so much about the camera. All the cameras are cool, but they, like, they change so fast. And I'm becoming less and less interested in cameras and lenses per se. I'm more interested in what you can do with them to help move people in the direction you want them to go in. I was actually like that with Mark Spencer last year at the conference yeah. because I watch so many of your videos and I'd never met Mark before. And then there we were and it's like, I feel like I know you. And um, it's sort of what, it is sort of internet fame. So what is it like to being internet famous? Do you, you, know? you know, Mark and I joke, I'm a big fish in a little pond. Yeah. Well, yeah, we all are big fish in a little pond. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's, it gives you a sense of what it must be like for really famous people though. It's, it's, it, it, and I don't mean this in a, in a bad way to discourage anyone from right. ever sort of saying hi or whatever, but, but it is weird when, when people know you better than, than you know, and you don't even know who they are. Yeah. I, I was working on a documentary about the one I mentioned earlier about the young kid, um, and I went to, a, to went one night where he was performing right. and walked past his family sitting in the front row. I nearly stopped and said hello but I stopped myself just in time. Just because I had been editing them three, the last three months and knew a lot about right. them, right. they had no idea who I was. I've never met any of them, and it would have been supremely creepy for me, for me to have made contact, and I stopped myself just in time. <laughs> like, how did you know this about me? That's really creepy. <laughs> that's really funny. That's funny. It is funny. But that's, you know, we get a little bit of that, particularly at this sort of conferences. You have lots of people who want to say hi. They've, been, they've enjoyed your product. and. It, yeah, that's that. You know what? That's actually very rewarding to it have is. people come up and say your your training has helped me so much. Thank you so much. It, you know, that's. I know it we, makes it it makes it worth it. You know, it does. Yeah. I get the I get the um, hey, I sent you an email about that thing. Remember? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Help me out yeah, a little yeah, bit more. I mean, yeah. certainly we're all we're all in business to make money. We have, we we need that to to keep our families yeah. clothed and under a roof and fed and everything. But I, I don't do this for the money. It's a, it's a very nice byproduct of wanting to help people. I, I agree. I think, I think the money is an indicator of your success in that regard. People are w rewarding you for your, um, your passion. But it's not a, it's not a means unto it's it. It's not a means unto itself. It's like, wow, I, I see that you have helped me. I mean, you know. It's funny that people... People who obsessively collect cats or newspapers or dolls are, are considered to be slightly odd in the head or mentally unstable, right. but people who obsessively collect large amounts of money are considered to be heroes, and I think that's a very wrong assessment. I think they're just as um, unbalanced in their, in their brain as people who obsessively collect newspapers or dolls or... Interesting thought. Interesting, yeah. Just as a money. money is only a means to an end. It's a, it, 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 it's a resource to allow you to do things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's all. For Trust me, it's just a resource. To Trust it. me, not having to worry about it is a whole lot better than having to worry about where the next month's rent is coming from. And we've yeah. been there as well. But Yeah, I've, I've been places where we've literally had 16 cents in our bank account. Yeah. 16 cents, and how are we... So yeah, I totally know oh, about yeah. that. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, so for yeah. anyone who's watching, we do, you know, it hasn't always been... Um, wonderful success it's been uh, it's been a struggle along the way but it's we had at IBC one of our do you like going to IBC I like going to Amsterdam <laughs> I like Europe I very much like Europe uh, and it's interesting being exposed to the Europeans too because they have a slightly different mindset than we do yeah. and Final Cut 10 is a lot more popular in Europe that's what I hear yeah all, all the, you know, they, they, they love it over there um, well they don't have the, quite the, the union structure that says things have to be done this way. They also have smaller markets, so everybody is looking to make quality content, but for the least amount of money that they can make quality content. And so when they can leverage something that gets the job done faster, like Final Cut Pro 10 and Lumberjack, then they are open to, to at least giving that a try on one project, and then maybe if it works, we'll roll it out into the rest of the organisation. So. There's a couple of production companies there that are slowly seeing Final Cut 10 on some of their shows replacing Media Composer. Um, and, it's and, it's fascinating, huh? And the best moment from IBC was, was when um, STV came up, they were doing a presentation about it, fin for, at the Final Cut Pro 10 tour about how they used Lumberjack and, um, and Final Cut Pro 10 on their, their project. And the th about the sixth or seventh slide in was just said, uh, it was pre-production, thanks to Philip and Greg. That was 
all the slides said. The next one said lumberjack and and. That's really nice. But it's it, it's an awesome moment. I mean, that, that to me makes it worthwhile. That's what that's what gives um, satisfaction. Yep. You know, money. I, I agree. Money gives me a different sort of satisfaction. <laughs> you, it's just it takes pressure off and it takes pressure sure. off, and you can focus on what you should be doing and not doing the thing that gets the next next dollar in the door. And so you can, and in terms of business, you can. Having just that little, little, little bit of money means that you can do the, the right thing rather than the cheapest expedient thing. I agree. Yeah. That's, that's, I couldn't agree more. You moved out of, you were in LA when we first met, and then you moved out to Prescott, Arizona? Prescott. Well, we, it's funny. In Prescott, we say Prescott. Like, oh, rhymes, Prescott. Well, yeah. rhymes with biscuit. So you say it like that. Prescott. Prescott. Isn't that weird? Yeah, we say it though. Like, Phoenix. Do, do you even hear the O? So it's kind of, right? <laughs> So we, we have a weird thing with O's in Arizona, okay? Okay. <laughs> Arizona. 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 Phoenix. Phoenix. <laughs> Phoenix. <laughs> anyway. So why, why, did you, why did you move out of the big city? A uh, couple reasons. One, it's uh, interesting. Um, for one, I, I was tired of the big city. I, I grew up there. I was born in LA. I'm one of the few people that actually said, uh -huh. I am... Um, I was born in LA and a, and, a, and a hospital doesn't exist anymore. I mean, who from LA is from LA or yeah, even, exactly. or even yeah. Arizona, who was from, anyway, so I was born there and then um, I just, it, I used to go to Santa Monica before I lived and it's 25 miles from the, where I was near LAX and it would, t for 25 miles it took almost two hours to get where I needed to go. That got old really, really fast and I wanted a quality lifestyle difference. I wanted a place, I wanted space, I wanted a horse. I wanted air, I wanted big skies, and, and I wanted to be a place where I could get to LA if I could to, could in a, in a, in a jiffy. So, so really, it was, a, it was just a lifestyle choice. I just, it was really time to go, and, uh, and I've been happy there. And now with the internet, I, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, I have an internet connection. I have a, my studio, I, we literally call it the digital barn. And if, and if you hear, if you listen closely, you'll often hear chickens kind of being picked up by the mics. <laughs> That's cute. That's very cute. Yeah. So. It's, it's been good. So how would you summarize the, your position in life right now? I'm happy. I mean, my, uh, my kids are doing good. My, I was telling you my older daughter's become an RN, so she's into helping people. And I, uh, my wife is my partner in my business, and it's just really nice to have someone close that you can share things with. And she's, she's awesome, does all the marketing. She's fantastic. Um, that's been good. Uh, and she's quite lovely. She, she, thank you so much. She loves talking to you, Doctor. She absolutely loves, loves it. So um, I'm just blessed and happy to, to where I live. And I, 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 there's a time where I don't want to work as hard as I am, uh, to be honestly, honest with you. I, at some point, I like to, I don't know what my exit strategy is, but I know there's going to be one at some point. I don't know what. I mean, I kind of have this, I, I love underwater photography and video. I just, I would love to do more of that. Kind of like have a passion when you know, some people like, like Randy Ubillos likes the drones. Well, I like taking a camera underwater and I like the underwater world. It's, I'd like to do more of that uh, at some point. And there's a lot of places in the world that I haven't seen from an, under the surface. I haven't been to Australia. I'd love to go to the Great Barrier Reef. I'd like to sit in a cage and watch. I like, like, why is it changing? Yeah, the reef is disappearing. It's dying slowly because of the pollution. It's dying quickly. Yes, That's really sad. One of the greatest reefs in the world. During the 60s, like Cousteau was doing the, the he did tons of shows on the Great Barrier Reef. And, oh, that's, that's sad to me. But, oh, yeah, well, you know, the, the world is kind of decaying, you know, and falling down, crumbling, and, uh, you know, second law, thermal, thermodynamics in play. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, that's, yeah, that's what I like. At some point, I'd like to figure out a way to not work as hard, you know. I, you know, that's, that's what I'd like to do. At some point, I don't know when. Right now, I'm still, you know, Happy producing. Yeah, I'm producing. I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do that than, you know, you know, flipping burgers or, you know, pouring yeah. cement. Pouring cement. Because in our, where I live, it's, there's, two, there's no industry. It's either you're, you're selling real estate or you're making real estate. In other words, you're <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, it, it's, it's nice to have lunch with somebody who's happy with their position in life and it with is. what they are doing. And uh, thank you very much for having lunch with us, Steve. I uh, enjoyed this lunch tremendously. Hopefully, you're going to see, like, barbecue hanging down my neck. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. That was a, that was a total blast. Thank you. <laughs> Was that fun? Yeah. And that's the first time we've got through.